Good morning. What we have here today is a fascinating collection of readings. And it's, it's fascinating to me, partly because the, the opening prayer, the collect of the day, is meant to be matched with the readings. Many of them were created by Thomas Cramner in the 1500s. Um, some of them are even more ancient than that. Um, and some of them are really, really old. But they're meant to be a kind of two or three line collection of the theme of the day. And I find that fascinating because the summarizing prayer of this day is that God is always more ready to hear than we are to pray. And this is the kicker here for these readings. And God is more ready to give us even more than we deserve and more than we can think to desire. And then we ask God in the prayer to give us that abundance and to forgive us the things we can't even bear to mention. Or to put it in the language that we've got here, forgive us those things of which our conscience is afraid. That would be those things we can barely even think of. They are so painful to us, whether that's shame or guilt or fear or any other dark emotion. That's what we're praying for. And in these readings, it, the readings could be characterized by everybody getting caught up short. Everybody thinking, well, I've got the goods. I've got what it takes. We're doing the right thing. We're making good decisions. We are awesome. And then in the midst of that, feeling like we got it good, we got it going on, coming to realize that, oops, this isn't what we're supposed to be doing. Oops. This isn't what God wants for us. Oops. You mean we weren't supposed to kill that person? Oops. You mean that wasn't a good idea? Oops. And maybe, maybe like me, you've had a couple of oops moments in your life. You know, those sorts of moments where it really seemed like a good idea at the time. And then afterwards, maybe immediately, Maybe the moment after you did that thing or you said that thing. Or maybe, maybe it took some time. Maybe a week, a month, several years afterwards. You look back and think, now why did I think that was a good idea? It was a terrible idea. It was a terrible thing. It was a terrible thing I said. It was a terrible thing I did. Or worse, worse than knowing it was just terrible, thinking but I really thought it was okay. I noticed this in my own life, particularly with interpersonal relationships. Uh, I like to pick on my relationship with my husband because, you know, there's so much good fodder there for forgiveness. And <laughs> there are moments when I think that I've been completely right in saying or doing what I've said. And it's only afterwards, sometimes the moment afterwards, sometimes several minutes later, that I realize, wow, that was, that thing I said was singularly unhelpful. That thing I said, I said for my own, <laughs> I said for my own self, my own desire to be right, my own desire to twist the knife. I didn't say it to be helpful. Oh, 
I convinced myself in the moment that I said it to be helpful. But, you know, in hindsight, I realized I didn't. And that's the theme of the lessons today. That hindsight is 2020, but that we don't always recognize it by ourselves. Or at least in the ancient world, they certainly didn't. In the ancient world, they needed prophets to come and yell at them. In the ancient world, they needed Jesus to come and teach them that it, God actually wanted them to love one another because that was not obvious. And in truth, it's not always obvious now. I mean, sure. Loving the people who are easy to love, that's the low-hanging fruit of, of being in relationship with people. But you know, finding out that someone you cannot stand has just contracted coronavirus and still managing to have compassion for them, that is love and forgiveness 201 or 301 or 401. That is the advanced course of love and forgiveness. And it doesn't always come easy. And it isn't always our gut reaction, our knee-jerk response, the very first thing that we think or feel or say or do. And what Jesus is trying to get us to is a place a mental, emotional, spiritual place where our gut reaction, our knee-jerk reaction, the very first thing that we think or feel or say or do is loving. And that is certainly why we pray for all the things we don't think we're worthy of. And why we pray to be forgiven of the things we can barely stand to even mention out loud. The things we can barely stand to even think of in the silence and secrecy of our hearts. And it's the reason why of all the readings today, I like the letter from Paul to the church at Philippi the most. And you know me, I don't often enjoy Paul's writings for a variety of reasons. Uh, his run-on sentences are definitely one of them. But in this portion of his letter to the Philippians, he's dealing with issues of boasting in that church and issues of people thinking that they're better than one another. Oh, hello, cat. That they that they can put other people down. And he's like, okay, okay. All of you, shut up. All of you, shut up. Because you know who's got the right to boast? I do. I have the right to boast. If anybody has the right to boast, I have the right to boast. And then he lists off, like some sort of resume, all of his credentials. And he's got them all. He's got them all. Any way you want to slice it, at least for these people in this culture, in this ancient world, he is the top of the heap. And he's pointing out that all of the ways in which anyone would think he's better than them, that he is to be more respected, more listened to, all of the ways that he is entitled and has bias. He's throwing it all to the ground. <laughs> and the particular Greek word he uses, oh, translations. Translations are funny. Uh, he says, I, I let go of all of these things. Specifically in this translation, he says, I suffer the loss of all these things. He's saying, I let go of all these things and I think of them as rubbish, except that the Greek word is not rubbish, like, you know, things that you throw away or perhaps in that time burn. Uh, the literal translation is human excrement. 
And there's a beautiful four letter word that I won't use. Uh, but that's how Paul regards all of his qualifications, all of the reasons that people would be biased to listen to him, to give him first preference in all things. These days in our culture, it would be a white man with a college education and a high salary throwing down all of his white privilege and his male privilege, stripping it all, all of his socioeconomic privilege, all of the important people he knows and has played golf with, stripping it all down and considering it as so much shit. Leaving it behind because he's finally found the one thing that matters. Golf with the governor doesn't matter. A six figure salary doesn't matter. The ability to drive down the street and know that a police officer will give him the benefit of the doubt doesn't matter, throwing it away. The ability to be compared with a woman, any woman, a fully qualified woman, a woman who has done better than him and still be considered better doesn't matter, throwing it away. Because he's found the one thing that is real because none of that other stuff is real. If it dies, if it can be killed, if it can change, it's not real. The only thing that is real is the love of God that we have for one another and that we see that most clearly of anyone in Jesus who has come to change our lives and to make them real. Amen.